friends. We're glad you could join us for Talk the Word. I'm your host, Pastor Peter Neary. And I'm Pastor Ryan Johnson. And we come to you from the Paradise Seventh-day Adventist Church in Las Vegas, Nevada. Amen. Uh, Pastor, before we get going, would you please have an opening word of prayer for us? What are we focusing on today in our prayer? Well, I do have a concern, um, a general concern, but specific also, and that is down in Cape Town, South Africa, mm -hmm. the second largest city there, known for tourism, for tourism, is going to be out of water somewhere in April, like 13th, 16th, something like that, completely out of water. Can you imagine? And why do I care? I'll tell you why I care. There are there are members of that society that have cars, money, and mobility. But there are people who live there that do not have cars, money, mobility. And they're going to be there trying to figure out what to do when the water runs out. Mm. But it's worse than that. Mm. In our world today, a fourth of the major cities are facing a water scarcity problem. In fact, we here in Las Vegas have a similar problem yes. because of drought mm. in the Rockies and the lack of snow melt and our lake mead is going down, down, down. Yes, it is. So I'd like to pray about that. Okay, let's do that okay. without any delay. So my friends, let's pray. Father, you are, God, you are a God of all mercy and a God of love and compassion. And we come to you in behalf of those who are living in Cape Town, South Africa, especially facing a water crisis, the first one on our planet that is actually going to happen shortly if a miracle doesn't take place. But you know it also is a problem in many areas of our world. And on the news and things, we're hearing more and more about it. So please be with those who are affected. And show us Christians especially how we can help so that we can support our brothers and sisters we haven't even met who may be without any kind of um, ability to escape the situation. And Lord, I also want to pray for our presentation today. As we open your sacred word, Lord, speak to our hearts and minds, teach us your truth. In fact, in John 17, 17, it says, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. And sanctify in the Greek means to set apart. So set us apart now by sending the Holy Spirit and teaching us and our friends who have joined us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 And amen. Thank you, amen. Pastor Neary. Friends, in our last program, we talked a bit about Adventism, the Advent, which means the second coming of Jesus Christ. And Pastor Neary broke some things down for us by putting certain categories up about the second coming so that we know that we are living and believing that which is true, that which is according to the word of God. He said that the second coming will be a literal coming, yes. not a spiritual, strange, metaphysical thing, but a physical coming. He said that Christ's return will be visible in fact, it will be visible by every single person on the planet. We said that Christ's return will be accompanied by an army of angels, indeed a cloud of angels, which is exactly the way yes. Christ went up. Yes. We said that Christ will come in the sky, but he will not touch the ground. He will remain in the sky and the dead in Christ would rise up to meet him. And we which are alive and remain will also go up and meet the Lord in the air. And we also said that the return of Jesus the Christ would be audible, an extremely loud event. The voice of the archangel, a shout 
and the trumpets of God, as we read in First Thessalonians, <laughs> First chapter Thessalonians, four. Yes. I understand that, Pastor Neary, you have another text you'd like to share with us about the audible nature yes. of Jesus's coming, and let's just jump in right there. Okay, we'll do that. We're going to turn to Second Peter, chapter three, verse ten. Uh, it's just, just too a graphic to, to overlook. I, I thought our friends would enjoy hearing this one as well as you and I. So, 2 Peter 3 and verse 10. And here's what it says. Do you want to read it? Oh, sure, sir. Okay. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10 reads, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. Have mercy. Have mercy. I'll tell you, when Jesus comes, sin and corrupted, uh, this pl corrupt planet has, is just going to melt, but not the uh, saved. They're going to rise to meet the Lord. And I want to point out here, it's very interesting in 2 Peter. It uses the phrase, a thief in the night. Hmm. And that's a phrase that they use often to advocate the secret rapture. Hmm. And they're implying that as a thief in the night means that you're going to be raptured away secretly and no one knows until you're missing, of course. Hmm and the damage that causes. But when you look at this text, you realize that it's not talking about the manner of Christ's return. It's talking about the timing of Christ's return. Mm -hmm. We do not know the day or the hour. And when he appears, it will be like a thief in the night. But notice it also says that on that day, it says, the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and both the works and the earth both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up and so i'm looking at this and i'm going there is nothing secret about this it is very visual audible physical a, a, glorious, bright, and noisy. <laughs> and so when I look at all these texts in the scriptures, the New Testament, I find nothing about a secret rapture. Mm. But there's one more category too that we want to cover, the last category, and that is it's very personal. Mm. And we want to look at Second uh, Timothy verse four, uh, chapter four, verse seven. Chapter 4, verse 7. So 2 Timothy 4, verse 7. Now here's Paul talking. In my Bible, this is Paul's farewell. Mm -hmm. And here's what it says. But I'm going to start at verse 6. Okay. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. Mm. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not to mean only, but to also all who have loved his appearing. Amen. It's very personal. Paul says that Jesus has a crown for me. When he returns, he's gonna give it to me, but not for me only, but all who look forward to his appearing. appearing. The second coming of Jesus Christ. Very visual, audible, very physical, real, just as you saw 
the angel said, as you see this Jesus going up in the clouds of heaven, he will so come in like manner. But also personal. Personal, yes. Amen. Amen. Now what I'd like to do, if, if it's all right with you, Pastor, yes, sir. is let's, let's look at one particular text that those who believe in the secret rapture um, use to teach it. It doesn't say secret rapture at all, but let's look at it. Okay. Okay, so let's take a look at Luke 17, the Gospel of Luke. And in this area, the Gospel of Luke 17, he's talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. And this is very important. Okay. And would you like to begin reading, Pastor, at 34 and 35 and 36? This is Luke, the 17th chapter, and beginning in verse 34. This is Jesus talking. And it reads, I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed. The one shall be taken and the other shall be left. Two women, verse 35, shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken and the other left. Two men shall be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. Now notice it doesn't say anything about a secret rapture. Mm -hmm. But they use this text because it says one's taken, one is left. And there is a there is an explanation of how Jesus did not in any way mean that there's a secret rapture. And so let's look at these verses very closely. The first one, I tell you, in that night there will be two men in one bed. One will be taken and one will be left. What the burden of Jesus' heart here in Luke is to convey to his disciples and you and I that there are only two people who will be in existence on the earth, two people groups. The first one is the saved and the second is the lost. Mm -hmm. Now it says there's two men in bed and Jesus is using symbolism here to teach us a lesson. Mm -hmm. For what do you do in bed? You sleep. You sleep. And we took a look already uh, last time that in 1 Thessalonians, three times Paul calls death sleep. Yes. And if we were to turn to John the 11th chapter, verse 11. In fact, Pastor, do you have John 11, 11? Can you read that for us? Certainly. The Gospel of John, yes. chapter 11 and verse 11. Again, this is Jesus speaking. It says, These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Okay, so I'm, I'm assuming we all are familiar with this story an incredible story towards the end of Jesus' ministry. He rose Lazarus from the dead. Mm. He received a message while he was far away from where they were that your friend Lazarus is sick. And, and they were hoping, Mary and Martha were hoping that Jesus would immediately come and heal him so it wouldn't be unto death. But Jesus didn't go. Mm. And his disciples were puzzled because they knew how he loved them very much. And finally he said, we must go because Lazarus is asleep. Mm -hmm. And the disciples scratched their head and they said, They said, then said his disciples, this is verse 12, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. How be it, Jesus spake of his death but they thought that he had spoken of taking a rest and sleep. And then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Lazarus is dead. 
Now, friends, when I sat where perhaps you're sitting right now, I was shocked. I was taught that when you die, you go to heaven or hell. Mm. But then I found out that the Bible teaches differently. And Jesus calls death sleep because that's what happens when you die. In fact, what would the sense of the resurrection or in the... Um, What's the sense in the resurrection talked about by Paul extensively in Corinthians and Thessalonians if people are already in heaven? And the reason Jesus is coming back is because his people aren't there. Hmm. They're sleeping in the grave and they're unaware of anything that's going on. And Jesus is coming back to waken us. And so here, sleep is a reference for death. Now, in our, in our uh, text that you read for us in Luke, it says two men are sleeping. Two men are in bed. So, two men are dead. Both of them are in the grave. When Jesus returns, the saved one will be resurrected. But the unsaved one will stay in the grave. Amen. The one taken is the, the righteous one, the saved one. And so now let's take a look at the second part of this. Look what it says. Two women, verse 35, will be grinding together. The one will be taken and the other left. Hmm. So now we have two women. Now in the Bible, do you, do you have Jeremiah 6, 2? Oh, let me get it. Jeremiah 6, 2. In the Bible... In symbols, a woman stands for the church. Um, in Revelation 12, a pure woman is the pure church. In Revelation 17, the uh, wicked, evil woman stands for the fallen church. Jeremiah 6, 2. Yeah. It reads, I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. And the daughter of Zion is a reference to church the church or actually it's a reference to to Jerusalem Israel and he refers to his people as a, as um, a woman mm -hmm. and so now in the New Testament the woman refers to a church so you've got two churches here and notice they're grinding they're grinding grain. And what do you make with grain that's grind, ground? You make bread. You make bread. And so you have two churches who are handling the word of God, mm. the bread of life. Mm. One of them is the pure church, the saved church. The other is the unsaved church. Mm. When Jesus returns, that those who are in the church in which they are saved will be taken but those who are dealing with false doctrine or false teachings will not be taken. They will be left. And then we move to the last one here, and that is verse 36. Mm -hmm. Do you have verse 36? Yes, sir. Would you read that? And it says in verse 36, we're back at Luke chapter 17, two men shall be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. All right, I, I just really enjoy this. I, I hope you're enjoying it. In Matthew 13, 28, there's a parable Jesus taught in which he clearly says the field in the parable stands for the world. world. Yeah, it stands for the world. So notice, in fact, would you like to read that? Yes, he said that's Matthew 13. 13 and, and verse 38. Yes. And this is after his parable. Um, I start at verse 37. He answered and said, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. And then here we are in verse 38. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. So you have two men here who are um, working the field, and the field stands for the world. 
And so in the last days, you will have missionaries who are out in the field doing the work of God who are saved, but you will have missionaries who are out in the field and they are not doing the work of God and they won't be saved. They will be left. They will be left. And so you see, this has nothing to do with the secret rapture. Now, just in case there's questions in their mind, let's look at Matthew 7. Okay. Matthew 7, 22. Because when we look at these two men, that they're out in the field, in the world, as missionaries, bringing the gospel, there are those that will be saved and those that will be lost. And in case that brings question to your mind, look what Jesus said towards the close of his Sermon on the Mount, chapter 7, verse, would you read 22 and 23? Sure, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 22 reads, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? Verse 23, And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And strong words. It's strong words, and it makes, it puts me on my toes. In fact, friend, I'd like to ask you a question, and, and I'm, I'm not being personal here. I just wanted to bring it home to your heart like it was to me. Have you ever raised anybody from the dead? Have you ever cleansed a leopard? I mean, look what it says they did there. They prophesied. Have you prophesied? They've prophesied. They've done all these things, casting out demons, uh, and it says wonders, mm. wonders. And Jesus said, I don't know you. Mm. Why? Because their hearts weren't right. Why? Because they didn't go according to what the Bible said. They were going by either what they learned or what they wanted to believe. And so when we look at, at uh, Luke 17, we discover that Jesus is using symbolism to teach us that when he returns, there's only two groups. There's the saved and the lost. And some of those are even in the churches. And so has nothing to do with the secret rapture, yet that is one of the main texts they use to prove it. The ladies and gentlemen in this program, we have looked at how Christ's return is very, very audible. But in the text that we used, we also see how it is referred to as a thief in the night coming. The Pastor Neary is shown here in the Word of God that when it uses that phrase, it does not mean that Christ's return will be secret. No, but rather thief in the night refers to the timing in that no one knows the day nor the hour. But the coming of Jesus will be gloriously loud, a worldwide event. But we have also looked at Luke, the 17th chapter, at this text that many use to argue for a secret coming of Christ. And Pastor Neary has shown us that where Jesus says two men in the bed, it refers to the sleep that is death. And one will be taken because he died in Christ and he one will be He died in left. Christ, that's right. He has shown where it says that two women grinding together. He has shown how grain is used to make bread and how bread refers to the word, word of God, living yep. word, the living bread. And one used it correctly and was taken and one did not and was left. And finally, two working in the field and Pastor Neary showed how in parable, Christ says the field is the world, missionaries, and how one worked iniquity and was left, and the other did that which was right, believed the truth, and was taken. Also, I forgot in our summary that Pastor Neary said that Christ God refers to his church, his people, as a woman. A woman. We even Pure looked at woman. Jeremiah, which mm -hmm. is just one text showing that. Pastor Neary, before we close, could you please give us a word of prayer? I'd be happy to. Let me pray for you and for us. Father, we are just excited on how the Bible can come alive. 
And now help us to search our Bibles to know your truth. For we do not want to be left, Lord. We want to be taken when you come in the clouds of glory with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, and you raise the dead first and then the alive second. We want to go home and get to know you more personally, to throw ourselves at your feet and thank you. And so, Lord, make it all possible and bless our friends now and bring us back to be together next time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to studying the Word with you next time. I'm your host, Pastor Ryan Johnson. And I'm Pastor Peter Neary. And as always, be encouraged.